Hi guys, it's Steph from My Driver Classic and today I'm back. I'm testing one of my favourite cars of the whole BMC BL era. It's the Rover 3005 or as you may know it, the Rover P6 V8. Now these are absolutely gorgeous cars. I've driven a Series 2 before but today is my first time driving a Series 1 and they only made these for two years. Now Cameron's given me the keys to it. It's his pride and joy. He feels about it like I feel about Jill. So I feel super honoured to be driving this car today. Now in this video I'm going to show you around the outside, I'm going to lift the hood, show you under the bonnet and then I'm going to take you out for a drive because honestly this is one of the most sensational exquisite cars I've ever been given the keys to and I cannot wait to show you. So let's go and have a look around the car. Now before we set off I had to show you this car, it is incredible. Now I'm going to call it the Rover P6 because kind of that's just how I know it as, um, but you may know it as the Rover 3005, the Rover 2000, they were known as many different things. So I had to show you this amazing car because it's absolutely incredible and it actually feels quite imposing for me, somebody who only drives a Mini Metro, but when you park next to one of the many bloated SUVs you see in 2019, it actually feels relatively felt. Now, the P6 um, took 15 years to design and develop and was sold under the umbrella of three different manufacturers, Rover Limited, Leyland Motors, and of course, my favorite, British Leyland. Part of this was due to that weird period in the 70s when they merged different marks, lumped them together under the umbrella of British Leyland, and so on and so on. Which, for iconic high-class brands such as Rover, it wasn't exactly a blessing because they were lumped in with marks that they didn't really feel were appropriate there was dubious build quality strikes and the general malaise of the 70s so really not a massive a massive one up for rover in fact a bit of a downturn now the p6 was released in 1963 and won european car of the year in 1964 so you don't need to take my word for it that this amazing car is really worth the hype and the reverence i'm giving in this video today it's been backed up by people who really know their cars now the car was in production till 19 77 and over 300,000 units were sold. Now this may not sound a lot and if you're thinking of things like um, the Marina for example it will sound quite low and it's simply because this wasn't the run-of-the-mill average working man's car. This was a car with gravitas and marketed at the more affluent professional worker and in fact it was seen as one of the very first executive cars. Now, just like other British Leyland cars of the era, they were made abroad too. So in addition to being manufactured in the West Midlands, they were made in South Africa and New Zealand. The 3005 was introduced in 1968 and was also called the Rover V8 Sport in South Africa and was really introduced to give it a stand apart difference from the Triumph 2000. And interestingly, Rover the, uh, the year previously had joined the Leyland family, making it more important than ever to create the car with a bit of a difference. Now, the car boasted a top speed speed of 114 miles per hour and could do 0 to 60 in just over 10 seconds. An impressive feat considering most other specs of the era, unless you were looking at something super sporty like a Jaguar, this really was, you know, out there. Now with most manufacturers claims and even on modern cars, unbiased testers usually fail to meet the advertised claims. However. Motoring mag uh, Motor Magazine took this out and they hit 117 miles per hour and reached 0 to 60 in under 10 seconds, giving this attractive car even more kudos. And as you'll see on the walk around, the V8 wasn't just hidden under the bonnet. The car boasted both internal and external badging to remind both the driver and passers by what a terrific car this really was. Now the P6 was replaced by the SD1, which in my opinion is another terrific rover, which is often highly thought of and well remembered. So we've done a bit of a nosy round including looking under the bonnet um, and by the way I'm just going to show you this let me just swing round come on swing round swing round um, basically it's a little plaque and it just tells you all the bits and pieces for putting into various bits of the car and it gives you some of the specs all in all um, a nice touch actually I wish I had it on my car so yes we've had a look around this car I'm sure you'll agree it's absolutely amazing and it's high time to jump behind the driver's wheel and show you the dash and have a chat with the owner Cameron now, some of the feedback that you guys have given me is that you love brochures and stuff. So I'm being forever tagged in things on Twitter and on Instagram. And if you're not following me already, it's just simple as you expect. I drive a classic. And um, when I jumped in today, this was one of the first things I spied. So it's the original book for the car. So we've got, this is like a 
this is like a little pack basically they would give you as the new owner and i thought i had to show you guys because i'm a bit of a fact geek and i'm a bit of a geek for this sort of thing anyway i've got no end of stuff like this for the metro now um it came with some various bits and pieces inside so you've got an owner's maintenance manual so i mean it's laid out it's so beautiful it's inside you've got um you've got supplied by you've got your telephone number you've got your chassis number engine number date of purchase now as we go through the book you've got all sorts of different things inside i just honestly i just love stuff like this it's so great um and you've got lots of just handy little graphics inside teaching you how to do things and some of this is quite advanced as well so some of this is stuff that most people nowadays it's not things like you get in your bro brochures now like how to set up your infotainment system and stuff this is properly like how to grease things how to sort things on suspension lubrication bleeding your brakes the sort of stuff that you would go to a garage for nowadays now let's have a look at what else we've got in here as well oh i love stuff like this i haven't looked at this before i turn the camera on because uh I just wanted to I just wanted it to be really genuine as to what I found in here and also if I found anything horrendous then um, you're gonna have to forgive me so let's look at the first thing that we've got here we've got distributors and dealers so let's see which my local one would be so it's really nice look so you would pick your town oh I love fonts like this in old brochures or if you're in design you'd know it as type um here we go Huddersfield so um got several Huddersfield ones there so that's cute I love that Oh, that's really nice. I don't know if any of those garages are still open, actually. Um, but look, I love stuff like this. I just think that it's real quality and, you know, you would be able to find. So if you were out around the UK and you were driving, because this is a car that can be driven, um, you would know where your nearest dealer was. I mean, it's just gorgeous. Look, and then you've got your optional equipment for Rover cars. So you've got all sorts on here so you can get your heated backlights god look at all the stuff you get on the luxury car on a metro it's things like um rear parcel shelf but it's literally got everything in here and you've got your parts mo parts numbers you've got the models that it's applicable to and you've got your radios there so i mean we're very lucky because we've got a radio in this i mean it is a modern one um but i'm not going to judge cameron too harshly for that um but yes lovely and also you've got all your prices in there as well so it's all in old money um which i absolutely love because as we've already discussed this car is from 1969 um so what else have we got in here we've got a maintenance manual supplement what's in this to be honest i feel like there's a lot of information here um but i mean look when we looked under the bonnet there was a lot going on um and as well you've got things like this which is just um i think it's like some sort of guarantee just some sort of guarantee there which is quite sweet and you've got all your so it's so this was filled in at some point so it says um do you have any other cars and they said they had so the person who owned this originally had another car they had a 1300 countryman um what does your new car replace it replaces a corsair um which i have driven actually and that was a beautiful car as well so whoever's bought this car very good taste um so what have they said they've said they had a 65 very very, very nice body rusting badly blah 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 so basically it was just like their feedback and then they would send this off to the market research company and i guess the idea was is that's how they would improve the products but um yes lovely and i love little stuff like this that so postage will be paid by the rover company and no postage stamp necessary if posted from great britain or northern ireland so i guess this is how they used to do stuff before uh, all those insane things that pop up on facebook asking for your feedback so again you've got your free service so you'd have just had all that filled in you've just got some other bits and pieces I mean, there's a lot going on here oh car tires in your safety and would you believe in the booklet so well we have a look at the dash in a little bit i'll talk to you about this but one of the things that it tells you when you look at the booklet because you it's, it says if you're going to go up to 112 miles an hour where are you going to go up to 112 miles an hour it says put an extra um up your tire pressure by an extra three psi um which is insane um so this is just kind of your car tires and your safety because the magical thing about this era was is that for some people and i don't think this would be your first car if you've never owned a car before um 
but the idea was is that for some people they may never have owned a car before so I guess all the information that they gave people had to be so precise and it had to be so full-on that if you've never owned a car before you were fully ready to start owning a car so it's to be honest it's a bit of a magical time really um oh british leyland as a british leyland owner you should read high road the british leyland car magazine i've never seen one of those it's published monthly by the british leyland motor corporation its purpose is to provide interesting reading for motorists but for basically for people that own bl cars regular articles provide authentic information on the bl organization that should have an s on not a z and its products the magazine being readable medium for keeping fully informed corporations activities it's available at bookstores and news agents Oh, I've never seen a copy of that. If you guys have got a copy of that, can you uh, can you link me in? Because I'd like to see what that looked like. Um, no ordinary motorist. Right, this is I love. So, as you might know, I'm a marketeer by that's kind of my that's my profession, um, and I love a bit of good marketing and a good strap line. So it says a rover or a rover owner is no ordinary motorist. That's brilliant. Um, his approach to motoring is considered and selective. He is a man. Come on. He is a man. I had a rover. I wasn't a man. He is a man who wants something better. Just as a man who buys a Land Rover wants something more than an ordinary car. Both in their different ways are connoisseurs. And between all connoisseurs, there is a bond of common interest. It is to foster this bond that the Rover Owners Association has been formed. So I guess kind of like the Owners Club. Um, Association of Autonomous Clubs in the UK and overseas, which aims to cater for all needs this is brilliant so various fields motoring is applied to rover cars land rovers and caravans and in fact it's probably worth mentioning at this point in the video this car was bought to tow a caravan and that's what those yellow lights from for because the owner of this car cameron takes it all over europe with his caravan because he runs the retro caravan club um which honestly i have such envy when i see him anyway um so this hasn't been filled in but you could have sent it off um again who is this run by how oh, lovely look at that just i love stuff like this so yeah this was run out of solihull as well so i guess this was run by the rover company itself and then we're down to our last thing which is just your literature pack so it just tells you what's inside so yeah absolutely lovely it's a few bits missing off this um which is your um clearex windscreen cleaner but i guess that's been used but yes a thoroughly interesting little pack there so um now that i've probably well some of you are probably bored half to death but i love stuff like this i'm gonna have a i'm gonna basically talk you through what the dash looks like because it looks very different to the mark ii that um some one of my friends owns a mark ii and it looks really different it's the first thing i said to camera when i jumped in i said oh my god it's so different um so i'm going to talk you through that as well so you can see what it looks like because it looks quite different to some of the other stuff that i've taken out before we set off driving i wanted to show you this dashboard now one of the most interesting things that Cameron told me was that Rover spent 15 years developing this car and everything on it was new. So if you've watched a few of my videos, things like the, um, what's a really good example, the uh, that that Leyland truck thing that I took out, what was it called? I um, can't remember. Anyway, it was... Uh, that pickup thing and it borrowed all the dash from the metro and a lot of things as time went on it started becoming a bit of a Leyland spares bin where different things would fit different things and it takes away some of the uniqueness but this car is completely unique when it when it was new to market and um, I really think it shows that they spent a lot of time developing it because there is an awful lot going on on the dash things that I drive a car from 1981 daily and the stuff that is on this car is completely it feels like streets ahead um, in terms of what it's got to offer in terms of how it's set out um, and the information and the luxury and as well my other daily car is from 1969 and this feels so advanced it's crazy so i wanted to show you the dash and talk you almost walk you through it so you can see what i've got in front of me as i drive so i'm going to start over here and work my way across to where i'm driving so these here that you'll be able to see so in fact let's start down here this is just for your glove box there's a lot in the glove box today so i'm not going to pop it open and here these are your fresh air vents now this is a cigarette lighter pretty normal as you would know but I was quite surprised to find out that this was fitted from new and then you've got your interior light you've got your um 
you've got your other lights over here you've got your fog you've got your wipers you've got your washers there's quite a lot going on over here but it almost reminds me of that morris minor where you've got everything kind of centralized over here you've got your heater controls down here and this i thought was so clever so as you've probably guessed this is a thirsty car now this is your petrol tank reserve so when you hear it cough which hopefully you wouldn't do because you wouldn't want to run it that low but should you run it that low it's got an extra eight liters in which is fantastic now here is a modern radio but you would have had something older there you've got your v8 badge over here so the styling is lovely you've got ashtray over here you've got your choke here now i'm going to bring you back so it's obviously a car for somebody who likes smoke because you've got a second ashtray over here and something that i quite liked that cameron showed me so i'm just going to adjust them up so i can get them into the camera for you these are the original seat belts but they were taken off a parachute hence why you've got this on and um, it's still on both seat belts which is quite nice um, now let me bring you up to the center console up here this here is a rev counter now this isn't usually where this would be so somebody has paid extra to have this put in usually you'd have your clock here and you'd have a blank space here but instead they've swapped it around so you've got your um your rev counter over here you've got your clock over here and then i'll bring you over to where i'm driving and so i was quite impressed by this but maybe it's because i am basic um but you've got your choke here standard oil standard you've got your um if in the center you tell you your headlights are on i would love that on the metro i don't even have that on the metro for goodness sake and you've got your um you've just got your lights there for your indicators now this i thought was quite was quite advanced for the era of the car it's just a brake warning light so it basically tells you if there's a leak in the system and as somebody who suffered complete brake failure before in a morris minor something like that would be well it's it's a great it's a great thing to have because brakes are life or death as i always say one of the most important things you should keep on with and of course you've got your ignition warning light there now everything across here if you've ever been in an austin 1100 you'll as, as we drive i'm going to get some filming footage of it to show you but instead of you know like usually you would have like a dial like this for your speedo it's actually like a little ticker tape so when i was talking to cameron about it i said oh, i've seen something really similar on the austin 1100 but i found out that the rover was the first car to do it so very interesting uh you've got your temperature over here always always such an essential thing to have and then when you've got your speedo you've got your speedo here it's in miles per hour and kilometers which obviously is a great addition for cameron and chris because when they go out and they tow the they tow the caravans around europe they're not having to do what we do and we did in the morris minor which is right on the window and over here you've got your fuel gauge and it's great because this car they've obviously thought about taking it outside the uk market because you've got your kilometers and as well you've got your fuel and it's listed in three different measurements you've got it in your gallons you've got it in your us gallons because i didn't know this until i started doing a bit of digging us gallons are different to uk gallons um so it's a fact there if you're watching from abroad um and you've also got your liters as well so i guess it was trying to think about that crossing over of the markets and as well that european market and then there's so much going on here honestly there's so much going on um i'm also going to show you you've got um this is just for your rear de mist and you've got what's the last thing i'm going to show you the last thing probably the most exciting thing i'm going to show you and you might catch a glimpse of camera in, in the camera is this so this mirror is i don't know if you can see can you see that can you poor cameron's nodding here um so you've got the mirror here now it's i think it's called convex it's convex isn't it it's convex i'm not very good with this sort of thing so the mirror is convex now the reason they've done that is um cameron kept apologizing for giving me all these amazing facts so i honestly don't i love stuff like this so the reason it's convex is is because it would have had the spare wheel um situated on the boot of the car because as you saw on the walk around the boot was flat and um it meant that that mirror meant that you could get um you could get full visibility over and you could get full vis vis visibility of the back and as the driver it's so weird it's so weird because it's not what i'm used to you can actually see and bear in mind it's 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 a wide car it feels very wide to me probably those of you that drive a modern car you know one of these giant suv things probably think this is pretty average size but for me it's a big step up and for some people it probably also was a big step up now i can see in that mirror both ends of the rear windscreen which gives me really good visibility when i'm trying to drive it trying to park it and trying to see the blind spots as well so um 
already I'm hugely impressed and I know I just know that I'm going to love driving it now some of the feedback I had from you guys was you loved it when we turned the camera on both of us when we did the ARX video so I've very reluctantly got Cameron to come on camera and talk to me about the Rover now for those of you just to put a bit of perspective in um I met Cameron years ago through Instagram and I started following because I loved his whole retro caravan vibe and um, he's gonna I'm gonna ask him a few questions and as well just about this car and also about the retro caravan club because um, I really want one but I've not managed to convince anybody to uh, to help me get one yet and also I do not have driveway space I need to be realistic but Cameron is very unrealistic and has some amazing cars and some amazing caravans so first of all Cameron why did you buy this rover to tow a caravan um i've had a rover p6 since i was uh, 18 mm -hmm. and i've had every four cylinder variant and now i was like i've got to get the dream one which is the v8 um, it came up at the right price it, i was so happy with my four cylinder that it had to be the perfect series one i wanted a white one with a red interior had to be a series one v8 there's a lot of differences between them for anoraks like me what are the differences how long have we got <laughs> <laughs> try and sum it up really really quickly um, basically in a nutshell the series one um was the original design as yeah. designed by rover um series two was like a, a sort of um a low budget facelift to compete mm -hmm. with the triumph 2000 okay um so there's lots of bits just kind of stuck on for no reason whatsoever um changes for the sake of them rather than the design yeah um and the series one is just very simple very mm -hmm. elegant i'm not saying the series two isn't i've had quite a few um but yeah there's that's mainly the differences so what made you pick what made you pick rover like what what led you down the path from amazing retro caravans to picking the car like how what makes a good towing car um basically a, a good towing car is something that's quite stable on the road mm -hmm. um the rover's got um very unusual suspension design they call it a dedeon tube at the back and it goes sideways as well as up and down so when you're towing it constantly maintains that all four wheels are in mm -hmm. proper contact with the road um traditionally a good tow car has an axle really far back but yeah. the rover one is obviously set quite in right so it can be a little bit unstable if there's a bit of wind um but really it's it it pulls very well and the v8 helps <laughs> what's the furthest you've gone um in this one yeah um probably about 1500 miles into belgium really? um That's but good. with my old p6 before this i had a 2200 twin carb and we did a 3000 mile tour of europe um no problems whatsoever and to think as well i think a lot of people now won't tow a modern they'll say oh i'm not taking my modern car that far and you've done it in something from the 1960s it's credible well we've done it with modern cars and we've actually had more problems with new cars than old ones really and it, it's like when a new car breaks down that's it there's nothing you can do we were stranded in um, france once with a nearly new passat because all the electrics had failed and it's like what can you do um at least we've had trivial things but you can just get your toolbox out and yeah have a play um my old one actually blew its head gasket in the black forest in germany and it was determined to get us to safety of the yeah. campsite and we had to limp up these hills every 10 minutes stopping letting it cool down filling up water containers in the river rhine to top up the radiator <laughs> but it's like it, it got us there yeah it got us off the road yeah um to a campsite where we stayed for about yeah. a week fantastic bought home <laughs> you've always got recovery <laughs> brilliant and then um can you tell me a little bit about because you run a caravan club don't you yeah so what is it uh we run the retro caravan club and mm -hmm. um, we started it in 2015 yeah um it's now we, well we started it for our friends and the minimum order of the magazine was 40 so we like made a list of all the friends and family who could beg yeah. to join and then we launched it on social media and it just went crazy we've now got over a thousand members um and next year we're hosting the european classic caravan rally it's been going Incredible. for 25 years it's never been to england so really no so there's we've not, never had a club big enough that can that's host amazing it. so we're very excited and it just keeps going from strength to strength really so if anybody out there wants you know because i think there are there's i was really surprised when i would so i i saw your stand at the nec last year it was brilliant wasn't it mm. so it's carry on camping theme surprise surprise um and uh, i was really surprised by how many young people were in your club so if people do want to join or want some caravan advice how would they best contact you 
Um, you can find us at retrocaravanclub.co.uk mm-hmm. or um, we're on Facebook, um, Instagram. Brilliant. Uh, we're everywhere, really. Can't get rid of us. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we just... A very welcoming club, very friendly. Um, like you say, there's, there's a, a real even... Mm. Um, distribution of ages um, there's people from 18 to I think 94 is our oldest member oh my god <laughs> so um, but everyone's quite young at heart that's yeah. the vibe but yeah. unlike the classic cars where it's sort of like you go sit in your classic car in a yeah. field and anoraks tell you what you haven't haven't had work done on it um, the caravan's totally different it's obviously you get a yeah. holiday out of it too um, and the common vibe is that um, everybody loves retro, so yeah. we all have a fight over the, what's in the charity shops. <laughs> we have uh, stampede to tragic. the car boot. Yeah, yeah. Um, we are that tragic, but it, it's good though. Your yeah. your stuff's brilliant. But yes, um, it's been so not. Thank you for lending me your car. Honestly, this car is perfect. I'm so excited. <laughs> right, we've had enough chit chat in the car. I think it's high time that Cameron let me take this absolute beast out onto the road. So we're going to head off now and uh, we're going to take her for a drive. Well, now that we've had a look around the outside, the inside, I've shown you through all the dash and we've looked through the little brochure pack that came with it, it's only right to start this car. Now, as you've already spotted, it's got the V8 badge and it's still got the V8 engine. So we're going to start it up, but we're going to do it slightly differently today. And for those of you that like the car startups, you're in for a treat because what we're going to do is we're going to start it on the inside and then I'm going to send Cameron out into the rain, stand behind the car so you can have a listen to what it would sound like if I was driving past you as a passenger or well pedestrian or uh, whizzing past you as you're stood at the bus stop or probably more appropriately as I overtake you on the motorway so let's start the car up and have a listen now um, with this being an auto it's um, it's got a little bit of a fault at the moment so it's having to be started in neutral which is fine it's just a case of foot on the brake and we'll start the car so let's have a go absolutely incredible i'm already so excited to take you guys out on the road but first i'm going to send cameron out to hear what it sounds like from the back now it's high time that we took this lovely car out on a test drive now guys this is probably one of the most luxurious cars i've ever driven and um it's just beautiful it's so nice to drive and i was quite i was look i'll be honest with you i was a little bit nervous getting behind the wheel of such a big car because i felt like it was going to be quite difficult to drive but with this rear view mirror or where as you, as you know when i was talking about it the convex mirror makes everything easy to see behind me i've also got the two mirrors at the end of the wing so i'll just um, i'll just pan out so you can see where they are as we drive and then I'll bring you back round to talk as I'm talking. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's really easy to drive. And it wasn't, I don't know, I drove that, I drove that Mark two years ago. And Matt, you need to get it back on the road so I can do a comparison video. Um, it's just so nice to drive. It's quiet, it's smooth. Honestly, we've been going over speed bumps and potholes because if you're not in the UK, I'm gonna give you a heads up. Our roads are terrible. They honestly, they look like it's like, chartering a car across the crater of the moon it's absolutely horrendous and this has just been taking it all in its stride and my visibility is great because as you probably saw when we panned out to the bonnet the view over the bonnet because of where i'm sat and i'm sat quite high i can see directly over the end so whilst from the outside it looks like quite a large to me it looks like quite a large imposing vehicle once you're behind the wheel it's very easy to drive and um i guess what my criticisms be? My criticisms, I guess I don't like these seat belts. I find it really difficult to adjust. It keeps sliding up my shoulder. It doesn't actually feel like it's offering much safety to me, really. Um, I feel like if anything happened, I feel like I'm not entirely sure that it'd be the best thing that I've ever worn. Um, but look, it's the 60s, it's 50 years old. You know, you're not gonna get everything right. But there is so much about this car that is right. And I absolutely adore it. So the steering wheel, it feels like, I do like a big steering wheel. Um, it's one of my things, it's, I think guess it's guess cutting your teeth on Morris Miners, you get used to that sort of thing. And the steering wheel feels right for the size of the car. Whereas I know when I've tested out some of your later Leyland stuff, like the, um, the Montego, the steering wheel felt quite small. It felt like it wasn't really offering much. And um, 
it's just honestly it's beautiful to drive and one of the things that I really like is I'm going to ask Cameron to bring the camera in to show you the little ticker tape speedo so if you have a look at that I'm going to speed up so you can see it so you should be able to see that coming up there and it's uh, it's very precise actually it's um it's quite good so if you think about it you only need to be thinking in your five mile hour increments and it's got it all marked out quite clearly and in fact I kind of prefer it really to your regular speedo. It's uh, it's quite it's quite good actually. Um, but yeah, really, I really enjoy driving it. It's quite quick as well. So you've got your V8. Now I imagined when I took out an auto, it was going to be quite slow. Um, which I guess is a, is a terrible thing to say. But people will say, oh, you know, don't go for an auto. Always go for a manual. But I'm so glad that Cameron's changed my mind on that because this is. Obviously, I can just put my foot down and I'm straight away off the lights. I'm really keeping up with the modern traffic. There's no problems with that at all. And for me, and for the age of the car, it's just, it just feels like streets ahead of where, of like, if, you know, if you're on the cars of this era, I guess like the stuff that I've driven is quite, you know, run of the mill. Uh, I guess from this era, what have I driven? That's around about the same age. The Corsair, you can watch the Corsair video, it's a bit louder than this. Your Morris Minor, well, look, your Morris Minor's so rattly in comparison to this, it's not true. But look, even as we go over your speed humps there, you're not feeling a great shake in the car, it's not impacting the driving experience. The steering is quite responsive as well. So if you drive a car of this era or you've got fond memories, you'll know the steering of many cars of this era wasn't that responsive. Whereas this, honestly, it's the smallest turn of the wheel. It starts responding straight away. And I'm really not used to that. It's, um, it's uh, yeah, it's very different, but I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. The Cameron's told me that um, I need to put my foot down. So once I get to 30, he said, put your foot flat down to the floor and um, just wait for it to kick down. So we are at 30, now it's time to put the foot down to the floor. And I've been assured that the noise is normal, so let's go. Oh my God, this is amazing. You didn't tell me it was this good. Oh my God. Oh, this is, this is brilliant. Honestly, I can see. Cameron told me what he spent on this car this year to repair it. I can absolutely see why he's done it. It is. Oh, I really want one. It's brilliant. As I was talking about earlier in the video, Rover spent 15 years designing this car. So there's some really nice touches, which um, oh, I'm going to wave to another Rover now. Hi. It's a boring modern Rover. Now, one of the most interesting things is, is that when you, um, so for example, when you're changing gear, let me just show you. There's like a little thing that you can slide your fingers into. Like, look at this unrivaled level of luxury. Look, I'm literally sliding my fingers into it. They go up and you go down. And the idea is basically is that your attention is on the driving experience and you're not being, you know, you're not being distracted by all the other bits and pieces that are going on. I mean, it's a real, I guess, you know, Rover was known for being such a luxury car experience. And I think that the way that, I'm just going to say it, the way that they took Rover towards the end, you know, even through things like the 80s, you still had your, your super glamorous USD ones and all the rest of it. But by the end, I'm not being nasty, but they were producing Rover 100s and Rover 114s, which as Alan Partridge would tell you, is essentially a rebadged Mini Metro, um, but it's not because it's got a K series and not an A series. And there's also lots of other differences, but I'm not going to get into it. Um, but look, in my opinion, I think that they really, really destroyed the Rover name. I mean, you get in cars like this, you get things like your SD1s, and you get a real sense for what Rover really meant. Things like, your, again, your Rover P4s. You get in stuff like that, and you get a real sense of what luxury meant for a Rover driver and why Rover was, you know, a car with a difference. Whereas I think that you get in your later Rovers, and they've really destroyed the brand name. And that is a true exercise in what not to do with a decent brand. Um, they really should have just carried on with Austin for your day. But then again, look at your early Austins. They were they were really lovely as well. Things like your Austin A30, your Austin A35. Real true luxury cars coming through. Um, well, not luxury, luxury like this, but you know, a decent cut above through to things like your Mini Metro. But anyway, I'm not gonna get caught up in that and how British Leyland destroyed some of the best brand names that ever existed in the British motoring industry um, because I could be here all day. I'm just gonna tell you that this car, it didn't take much to sell it to me when I got in because I could really tell that design had been, you know, design had been so carefully thought about and it's just honestly, it's been an incredible driving experience today. And giving the keys back to Cameron, um, it's gonna be a very reluctant experience today because I've really enjoyed it. It's been a beautiful car to drive. It's, the handling is just, the handling is like no other car that I've driven in so long. And uh, yeah, I've really, really enjoyed it. And to think that you can you can fritter 
time for me to head off home now because we're nearly back and um, I guess all that's left for me to say is if you haven't already make sure you subscribe by and large new videos go up every Wednesday every Sunday I try and feature the everyday classics the modern classics through to the crazier stuff like the Snuggie if you haven't already watched it and um, I try and just bring back the joy to 